Wesley Wayne Weber is a Canadian who is considered one of the country's most prominent counterfeit banknote creators. Weber succeeded in counterfeiting the 1986 series Canadian $100 bill. They were the highest quality computer-produced counterfeits to Canadian banknotes to date. Between 10 and 19% of retailers nationwide refused to accept $100 bills as payment due to the difficulty in identifying the fake copies. Do you want to know more about the story of Wesley Weber? Stay tuned until the end of the video to learn more. The 2006 Canadian documentary series Masterminds featured an episode about Wesley Weber. Before he started to counterfeit note production, he always was looking for the recipe that would make him cool among his peers. He wanted the lifestyle, the girls, the booze, and the money. Pretty soon it occurred to him, what if you could just print money? It's just an engineered photo on a piece of paper. It's not dropped from the heavens. As a kid, the computer was his best buddy, and he had tried making some tens and twenties, but he thought it'd be too difficult to do on a large scale. One night, he threw a hundred dollar bill onto a scanner and he printed it out to see where the deficits lay. It took him about five or six months to get a reasonable facsimile, but the paper wasn't right. Banknotes and don't glow under UV light. He went to Toronto and told this paper shop that he ran a bar and he needed paper that didn't glow under fluorescent lights. They brought out a brochure that explained all of the terminology of the pulp and paper industry. And they said, you need archival, quality paper. To simulate the planchettes, those fluorescent polymer dots were embedded in real banknotes. He bought $5 worth of fluorescent paint at Loomis and Tolls. After which he started looking into the optical security device, the color-changing square of foil on the Birds of Canada Notes series. He didn't have the money to manufacture his own foil, but he found an art supplier in New York that sold the paint in acrylic form, so he made a stencil. He used a hot stamping machine to put on the 100. Eventually, he found a place called API Foils in New Jersey that could make the foil. He told them that he ran a graphics company. He used $700 Hewitt Packard printer to print the bills, but it couldn't beat the color ink jets. After about three months, his friends convinced him the bills were perfect. They literally got stuck in the door trying to be the first to pass them. They bought a carton of cigarettes at a convenience store on Wyandotte Street in Windsor and came back with the change. And then the circus began. They bought stuff at Canadian Tire, Home Depot, and Business Depot, and then returned it to launder the money. One buddy started wiring cash to himself at Money Mart. He couldn't pass a bill for five months. By September 2000, he started seeing the bills taped to a lot of merchants' cash registers. One of his friends, who worked in a bank, got a letter from the RCMP describing the deficiencies in the notes. He was given the letter and he was able to fix everything, but he was paranoid. They started selling it to a Middle Eastern fellow in Windsor for 24 cents on the dollar. He funneled it to other groups. He once invited them to his house and he said, We have a friend in Iraq and we want you to consider moving to one of Saddam's palaces. You could undermine the West by printing counterfeit. You'd be treated like a hero. He was dead serious. Another time, he taped half a million dollars to a guy who was flying to Iraq. When they first started, it took 11 guys 13 hours to make $100,000. By the time they were arrested 14 months later and an A-frame cottage they'd rented in Lakeshore near Windsor, they already had four guys making a hundred grand in half an hour. His lifestyle was perverted. He had a safe from Canadian Tire with $300,000 in it with real money. He had money on top of the freezer and money in the freezer. He owned a 98 Ferrari Spider, SVT Cobra Mustang Convertible, a Tahoe, a Jeep Grand Cherokee, and a BMW 325, but his condo only had two parking spots. He had big screen TVs, leather couches, and snowmobiles. He had no purpose, but when you're making eight to $12,000 a day in clean money, it was a way of persuading you to keep going. On July 11, 2001, they were sitting at a dining room table. There was no sound, just the monotonous drone of the printer, and then there was a boom. The big oak patio doors came off their hinges, and these cops came in with guns and yelled at them to get on the ground. He was resting his head on his co-accused's ass, and when he tried to move, somebody stomped on him and chipped his front teeth. The printers were still going. He could hear the carriages going. The wind was 
coming in off the lake and hundred dollar bills were flying around like leaves. The RCMP had been watching them for months. They had a command center set up next door. They'd broken into their territory and they'd hooked up audio and video surveillance equipment. Anyone with half a brain would have figured out, but he's cocky. He had all sorts of ideas how to outsmart the RCMP, but you can't ever outsmart those guys. He pleaded guilty and he got five years and seven months in jail, though he only served 13 months because it was a white collar crime. But for the first five months, Weber was at Millhaven, a maximum security institution west of Kingston. He saw guys get stabbed there. He had learned things in jail. Don't whistle. It shows disrespect. Don't ask what anyone's in for, and don't call anyone a goof. He spent most of his sentence at Bath, a medium security jail next door. It was like a campground. He lived in a house with a barbecue. He played tennis. He equally had a garden he grew corn and watermelons on. That's where he met a gentleman who introduced him to the stock market. He didn't even know what equity or a bond was, but he learned by watching CNBC. Maria Bartiromo and Joe Kernan were like family. He started waking up at 6 a.m. and keeping track of all his hypothetical trades on a piece of foolscap. He had to fill 500 sheets of paper before he got into trading real money. He built up a fictitious account of $100,000 in a few months. He decided to sell his Cobra and do it for real. He sent $16,000 to a lawyer in Kingston. She hired a 19-year-old girl to sit on the phone all day and trade stocks for him. He paid the lawyer $400 a week. He'd wake up at 7 a.m. and put together a list of stocks he was interested in. She'd read the quotes to him in real time and he'd plot them on a graph paper. Then he would say, buy a thousand shares. They'd make $300 or $400, but he was in jail. Weber got out on July 6, 2006, after his second parole violation. He'd been inside for 19 months. So, he decided to treat himself staying in the penthouse of the Mariner Terrace with a hot tub on the balcony overlooking Sky Dome. It cost him $5,500 a month. His intention was to do it for a couple of months, to breathe some of the life back into himself, but it turned into six months. He lived in Richmond Hill now, and he began working at a Rogers store, selling phones. Weber was still trading, but he had about $1.4 million in his account, mainly from investors. If he couldn't earn $4,500 a week for himself, then he's a clown. The only way a stock moves is from greed or fear. He lived both, so he doesn't have those reactions. It's called functionally psychotic. Wesley Weber was also nabbed for an illegal pot shop bigwig in 2019 that should get him 16 months for securities offense, the prosecutor says. He was one of the main players behind a high-profile chain of illegal Ontario pot shops. He deserves another 15 to 16 months in jail for an unrelated conviction. Ontario's security regulator urged a judge on Monday. Weber, who was recently revealed as one of the people behind the cafe chain of unlicensed dispensaries in Toronto, was a provincial court for a sentencing hearing on his latest in a long string of infractions. In January of 2019, he pled guilty to breaching a 2011 Ontario Securities Commission order that banned him from trading in securities for 15 years. As a breach, this is the most serious breach there can be, OSC Senior Prosecutor Rachel Young said in asking for the unusually long sentence for a Securities Act violation. The OSC's written sentencing submissions say, Weber took intentional and deliberate steps to circumvent the cease trade order, including using a different surname and he's demonstrated outright contempt for the regulator that made this order against him. Selwyn Pieters, Weber's lawyer, who also defends defendants in a number of narcotics charges originating from law enforcement raids on CAFE, reminded the court that Weber's violation wasn't fraud, that there were no proved investment losses, and that no compensation was required. We would say that at the maximum you should give him 30 days, Pieters told the judge. Pieters suggested Weber really merits a non-jail sentence involving probation and community service. The cops say, you're a mastermind, but he said he was a master moron. His softest point was hearing his parents cry on the phone. Although he was playing tennis in jail, his mother was worried that he was getting stabbed. Karma is a big thing in everything, wouldn't you agree? You can leave your thoughts and questions in the comment section. Thanks for watching this video. Do give this video a like if you feel like it, and don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon to get notifications when we post new videos.